Okay. Uh, okay, so for the last talk of uh, the workshop, I guess, we have Jihan Oke, who's going to talk about stable homotopy and quantum contextuality. Okay, thank you very much, William. Uh, so let me share my screen first. Um, okay. Things over here, so okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, stable homotopy uh, and quantum contextuality. So maybe just to be more explicit, so the talk is going to be about uh, linear constraint systems and their operator solutions. Uh, so William talked about it in the in the morning. So uh, I will recap uh, the definition. And uh, I will try to apply some uh, material from uh, some ideas from stable homotopy theory. And by stable homotopy theory, I mean uh, you can think about generalized cohomology theories that Theo talked about yesterday. So I have a relatively easy uh, task because it's the last talk, and uh, there's some uh, previous talks kind of kind of help me to uh, set up the background. So let's see uh, how it will go. So the linear constraint systems. Uh, as William mentioned, so it's going to be, uh, we are looking for operator solutions, meaning that solutions in the unitary group. Uh, so I will be only concentrating on finite dimensional case, uh, although uh, you can think about these questions in a more general setting. Uh, so uh, the linear system that we have is an equation of uh, this sort. So I think you can see my uh, mouse pointer. And uh, so here, normally you can solve this equation over integers mod d, but you can look for more general solutions over the unitary group and uh, more uh, precisely an operator solution or a quantum solution is this set of uh, unitary matrices uh, that satisfy the following three properties. So the first one is, uh, I will refer to this uh, being a detorsion property. That means the d power of each matrix is equal to the identity matrix. And there's a commutativity property which says that if uh, in a row, uh, if there are two entries non-zero, like MI, MKI and MKJ here, then the corresponding matrices AI and AJ is supposed to commute. Um, and the last one is, you should think of this linear equation not in the additive form, but in the multiplicative form as follows. So the coefficients in the matrix um, goes as powers of, uh, uh, powers of, of the matrices AI, uh, as you see here. And then the product of these uh, matrices is supposed to be uh, omega, where omega is the d to top unity to power bk, and bk's are the uh, elements in the column here on the right. Um, so this is uh, the definition of an operator solution. So that will be a fundamental uh, definition that we should keep in mind uh, during your talk. And uh, there's another uh, uh, formulation. Uh, also, uh, William mentioned about this, but I will be doing the formulation in a dual fashion. Uh, namely, the vertices are, are going to stand for the variables and the uh, edges are going to stand for the contexts. Uh, so each context uh, consists of the vertices uh, for which the uh, corresponding coefficient is non-zero. So you're picking up the uh, non-zero coefficients from the row. And there is an instance relation which uh, encodes the entries of the matrix. Uh, the right-hand side of the equation, the BK uh, entries, they are going to be encoded as a function on the edge set or the set of contexts, in other words. And an operator solution, we can think of uh, as, a, as a function of a special sort that satisfies the previous uh, three properties. And these are, uh, I'm going to denote it as T, capital T. Uh, if, uh, if the linear constraint system admits a solution over the unitary group, uh, uh, of one by one matrices, the scalar matrices U1, then uh, the solution is called a scalar solution or a classical solution. Uh, so the, uh, the fundamental example is the uh, Mermin square uh, and the Mermin star examples. Uh, so as you see, uh, in these examples, the lines uh, correspond to the contexts and the vertices uh, are the variables in each case. Uh, so uh, the uh, the tau or the BKs uh, take values zero in every context except on the red ones. Uh, 
in both cases. Uh, so these two examples, they don't admit a scalar solution, but they admit a solution over the unitary group. In particular, on the left-hand side, these are Pauli matrices, tensor products of Pauli matrices. So the unitary group, uh, uh, the matrices here are, are uh, four by four, and the matrices on the right-hand side, are, they are eight by eight. Uh, so these two examples, I will come back to uh, from time to time and then discuss uh, the uh, construction on these examples. Uh, so I can't see any questions or anything. If there are questions, you can interrupt. Um, so um, I think I can't, I can't see the Q&A, so I don't know why, but so um, the, um, uh, so I want to uh, pass slowly to the topological formulation and the first step is the chain complex formulation. So it's uh, equivalently, there's a different way of uh, encoding the hypergraph information in a chain complex fashion. So we have three input inputs for the hypergraph, B, E, and epsilon. So these can be arranged into a, a chain complex where uh, the, uh, the uh, V and E, they are going to be the generators for the one chains and the two chains. And there will be only a one generator for the zero chains. Uh, so you can think of if D were a prime, then you can think of the C1 and C2 as uh, the um, uh, the the uh, vector space uh, with basis elements given by uh, labeled by V and labeled by E, uh, respectively. So the epsilon, the incidence relation, encode uh, it's encoded uh, inside the boundary map of the first uh, the boundary mappings in the in the in here. Uh, so they just appear as coefficients uh, for the in front of the V V uh, basis elements, and the second. Uh, differential or boundary map is just zero. So that's all the input is uh, used as uh, some part of the, in the, in some part of the chain complex. And this is uh, an equivalent way of encoding the same thing. Uh, for any chain complex, there's a dual concept called co chain complex. And in this case, um, so you can obtain uh, one from the other. So um, uh, zero, zero co chains are again, one dimensional and one core chains and two core chains, they're given by set of functions on V and E. And we think of these set of functions as a Z mod D module uh, or a vector space by uh, where the operations of addition and multiplication are induced by pointwise addition and multiplication on the target. Or equivalently, we can think of them as linear maps on C1, uh, one chains and two, two chains. There are two ways of thinking about them. And uh, the co-boundary map in the co-chain complex, it's uh, defined using the boundary map on the chain complex. So if you have a, a function, uh, which is a one co-chain, if you take the co-boundary of that, uh, so that means you can apply to an element in E, first you take the uh, boundary of E and then you apply F and you use a linearity property to be able to compute this last thing. So this, uh, this is the co-chain complex definition uh, I want to define only cohomology group because uh, that's the one I will be talking mostly. So homology groups are defined uh, with respect to the chain complex instead of the cochain complex. So if you have a cochain complex, it's just a sequence of uh, uh, objects like this and the linear maps between them. Uh, so the n cohomology group is going to be defined as uh, the quotient group of the kernel of dn here divided by the image of image of dn plus dn minus one. So being a cochain complex means that the successive composition of any two maps is zero. Therefore, this quotient makes sense. That means the image is always going to land inside the kernel. So if you go back to the example that comes from the hypergraph, uh, so tau, so we think of tau as the right-hand side column of the matrix equation of the linear constraint system. It was just a function on the set of edges. We can think of it uh, as an element of C2 because C2 is essentially functions on the edges. Therefore, there will be a corresponding cohomology class in degree two of the cochain complex. So this is, uh, uh, this is a cohomological way of thinking about what tau is. So uh, there's one more step uh, that we can go further from chain complexes to spaces. And there is a combinatorial way of thinking about spaces, namely called cell complexes. And you can think of them uh, as a topological version of chain complexes. Uh, so more precisely, a cell complex uh, is a topological space constructed from uh, cells 
uh, of increasing dimension by attaching these cells uh, from their boundary to the uh, to the previous thing that you construct as you go along this uh, definition uh, construction uh, as you increase the dimension. And the, an N cell is is a is represented by an N disk, and the boundary of the N disk is an N minus one secure. So that's the thing that you're attaching. Uh, so the chain uh, there's a chain complex associated to a cell uh, cell, cell complex. So uh, what you think is uh, the uh, the what what you take is the uh, as the generators of the chain complex is the uh, set of N cells. So there are zero cells like points. There are one cell like edges. Two cells. Uh, as two disks and so on. So you arrange these things and then look at the uh, Z, ZD modules generated by, by these sets or uh, vector spaces if these are prime. Then the attaching uh, maps, they are, they are encoded as boundary maps here. So they turn into linear maps uh, between these objects. And this is a chain complex. And in, in this case, uh, we can again think about the homology and cohomology groups. Uh, if you take the dual of this chain complex, you can obtain the co-chain complex. And the uh, usual not topologist notation for homology and cohomology are uh, given like this, hn of x, uh, h over n of x, and h over of n of x. So uh, this will be the notation I will be using. And most of the time, the coefficients are z mod t. Uh, that's the only coefficients I will be using, except one time. Uh, so there's a topological realization for a hypergraph. Uh, so we have seen the chain complex realization, but there's a topological realization which is uh, which gives us as a us a little more flexibility, uh, uh, as as I was uh, as you will see in the definition. So if you have a hypergraph, uh, then a topological realization is connected to dimensional cell complex, uh, whose one cells are given by uh, the set of vertices and two cells are given by the set of edges, and uh, recall that the thing downstairs is the chain complex of the hypergraph. If you look at the chain complex uh, of the topological realization, which is the top part here, uh, we should have uh, these uh, Z mod D module on E, Z mod D module on D, and Z mod D module on the zero cells. So what we are, uh, uh, we, what, what we want is a homomorphism of chain complexes from the the chain complex of the topological space to the chain complex of the hypergraph that we defined. So what does that mean? So that means we have these linear maps going downstairs and each square here commutes so that the composition of these two maps are the same and similarly here. And what uh, this allows us is that we can increase the number of vertices over here uh, in, the, in the chain complex of the space or the, we can add more vertices to the space itself. Uh, that's that's a way to think about it. There's also a space which realizes the uh, bottom part here. Uh, so if you think from that point of view, you're adding vertices to the space. Uh, so, but you keep the one cells and two cells the same. Uh, the connectedness uh, constraint here implies that the zero homology of the space is equal is one dimensional. So this is what connectivity means. Uh, so there are two important results uh, that we have proved with Robert, and uh, uh, in the first uh, in the, the first term, it goes back to the uh, earlier work with Sam Roberts and Stephen Bartlett. Uh, so there, uh, you can see that the cohomology cl class, which corresponds to the tau in the linear constraint system, uh, it is zero in the cohomology group uh, of any uh, topological realization, if and only if the, the if and only if the linear constraint system admits a scalar solution. Uh, so this is uh, a cohomological characterization or homological uh, characterizing the existence of scalar solutions. And the second theorem it goes a little more deeper into the topology of the situation, and uh, it says the following: If the linear constraint system admits an operator solution but no scalar solution, uh, these kind of situations are also called contextual. Uh, uh, in the in the in the Cauchy specter specter sense, so then the uh, any topological realization that we can come up with, uh, it has to have non-trivial fundamental group. Uh, that means the space that we construct, uh, we can we are able to construct out of the hypergraph. They are all have non-trivial uh, fundamental. Uh, they all have non-trivial fundamental group, meaning that there should be uh, non-contractible loops, like a, like a torus, for example. So this uh, result can be seen as an extension of uh, Arkhipov, Arkhipov's result. Uh, so this is a more uh, this is a topological way of thinking about uh, 
his result where he uses graphs uh, as William uh, mentioned in his talk. Uh, so these are the two results, uh, but I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to uh, prove these, but these are just a justification why, uh, for the usefulness of these techniques. Uh, in this talk, we will focus on something different. So just to tell you more about the topological realization that we should think about in mind, uh, so the Mermin square here is arranged into a topological realization on the left, and the Mermin star is arranged a topological realization on the right. So in these pictures, we see two torus, two tori. So this is a tor torus, and this is a torus as well. So the uh, the top part and the bottom part and the left and side, the uh, right side of the of the square here, they're identified. So they are uh, they are the same labels here as you see, and similarly over on the right hand side. On the left hand side, the cell structure of the torus consists of triangles. So these are the two disks that we think of with a triangulated boundary. And on the right hand side, we have disks again, but then uh, in this case, the uh, boundary is uh, partitioned into four, 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 four parts. So there's like, uh, it's a different uh, cell structure of the torus. So this is the example that we should think about when I say a topological realization. As we see, the, you know the Mermin star and square, these are contextual examples. Uh, so the theorem here uh, also can be observed in this example. The uh, topological realization are, to, uh, are both are uh, tori, so that they have non-contractible groups. And this is uh, an illustration of the theorem. So what is this talk about? So the, in this talk, uh, we are going to be concentrated in uh, uh, in, in operator solutions of linear constraint systems. And we want to uh, classify these operator solutions uh, in a topological way. And before that, uh, there must be uh, an, an interpretation of operator solutions in a topological way so that we can introduce ideas from homotopy theory to be able to classify uh, operator solutions, meaning that when these two operator solutions behave uh, similarly in, this, in, the, in, in the sense of being contextual or not, for example. Uh, but you can say more things uh, about the structure of operator solutions from the homotopical perspective if you, uh, if you once able to formulate operator solutions in a topological way. So, so far, we have uh, the topological formulation for the linear constraint system, meaning that these two inputs are turned into two other things, uh, a two-dimensional cell complex and a two-dimensional cohomology class. So let's see what the T, capital T, the operator solutions are going to turn into. So the idea is the following. Uh, the idea is essentially to come up with a space, a target space, this is another cell complex, D by dm, so the two parameters D and M, M here is the operator solutions that we are seeking for, they, uh, these two parameters are going to be used to define a topological space, which is not necessarily finite dimensional. It's going to have infinitely many number of cells in increasing dimensions. So I will tell you how it is constructed and then turn the function, uh, which is the operator solution T, into a topological, uh, a map between the topological spaces. And this map is going to be defined up to homotopy. Therefore, given the triple, the linear constraint system plus the operator solution, we are going to be able to turn this into the this topological realization, two-dimensional side complex, the cohomology class, plus the homotopy class of this map that we will construct. So this is the idea. So any questions so far? Uh, feel free to interrupt. Um, so otherwise I will just continue with the definition of the uh, space, how that is constructed. Ihan. Uh, yes, Robert. Could you just repeat your last sentence? My my internet connection was unstable. If you could just repeat what you just said, the for, the bottom formula on this slide. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, saying this. I will. Uh, sure. Yes, I was saying that. Uh, so the input here that we are uh, going to topologically in interpret is a linear constraint system, plus the operator solution. So so uh, so what we want to do. This triple is going to be turned into a topological data consisting of a topological realization, which is a two-dimensional cell complex, a two-dimensional cohomology class on the uh, space, plus a homotopy class of a map. And the map here is going to be this map on the top. Uh, so this is the topological, this is going to be the topological interpretation of an operator solution. And now I want to construct the space B bar dm. 
So that will use, okay, thanks. Uh, so that will use ideas from uh, topology, namely the classifying spaces, which are fundamental objects. So let's take a group. Uh, so this con construction can be done for any group, but actually I'm thinking of unitary groups. Uh, so the classifying space is denoted by BG, and it's a cell complex, again. Uh, it, and the cells here, uh, N cells, are given by the set of N tuples of the group. And these objects are also used in classification of uh, SPT phases, for example, in the bosonic case, uh, like group cohomology, for example, would be obtained from this space. This is kind of the topologist way of approaching uh, group cohomology. And these uh, uh, N tuples are thought of as N synthesis in the following way. So first of all, the zero simplex, there's only a single zero simplex here. There's a single vertex, so I'm not, uh, there's no label for that. So it's just omitted here in the picture. So the one cells, they, are cons they consist of uh, just the group elements. So each group element is thought of as a one simplex here. And more precisely, this is actually thought of as a loop. So you think of this uh, zero and one here is identified. So it's actually a loop uh, uh, indexed by the group element. And then pairs of group elements, they correspond to two cells. So you think of them as triangles like this. And the third edge here, which is unlabeled, it's automatically labeled by the product of the two elements. So this is labeled by G1 times G2. Uh, therefore, it's omitted because this is kind of the rule. If you have two things like that, the third is going to be the product. And the three cells are going to be three poles of group elements. And the way you label them uh, is you put them on these edges on the, on the tetrahedron, and the other edges are also automatically determined by the product of the other two, uh, if you focus on a triangle on the face. Of course, these are just uh, cells in a, this, uh, like they're not seeing each other at this point, at this description. So you have to glue them to, the, to each other in a certain way. So I'm not describing how they are glued, but you can think of, for example, this triangle here is supposed to be glued to this side of the tetrahedron because the G1 and G2, they match with the G1 and G2 here. They have the same label. So it's kind of uh, not hard to guess how the gluing is. Uh, but this space is not going to stop here. It will have four dimensional, five dimensional, and so on, up to infinity, like infinite dimensional cells. So it's not going to stop anywhere. So it's an infinite dimensional space in general. Okay, so it's a classifying space. But what we want to do is to modify the space uh, so that it can be used to classify operator solutions of linear constraint systems. So we should add something uh, from the definition of linear constraint system. So you start seeing the definition of uh, the, the three items in the definition of the linear constraint system, the first two appears. Uh, so we want to construct the subspace of the classifying space of the unitary group. But uh, instead of taking all the antiples, we want to take antiples, so these are matrices, uh, with, with constraints on them. So the first constraint is that the d, 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 d power, so this is the detorsion constraint, the d, d power of each element here is supposed to be the identity matrix. The uh, matrices here that appear in this tuple, they are supposed to pairwise commute. And this construction was introduced by uh, Adam Cohen and uh, Torres Giese uh, and variations of these uh, constructions uh, in, this, in this paper cited down here. Uh, so I think there's a raised hand, uh, I can see, but I am not sure if I can, uh, if I can. Um, so it's, uh, it's not, uh, uh, something yeah, I the, the thing is, yeah, maybe I should have made you a host, uh, a co-host before doing this, because I don't think you can uh, allow speakers to, but maybe I can just stop sure. sharing the screen and then do that and then come back again. So. Let me. Uh, I, uh, I can also see the Q and A if somebody wants to put a question in the uh, Q and A. Okay, so now the question is, uh, what is N here? Okay, sorry. Let me just go back. Okay, so what is N here? Oh, okay, so N uh, here is the N cells. So we are thinking of the N cells of the space. So I'm telling what the N cells of the space is. So N is changing from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 up to infinity. And N here is specifically these N cells of the space. Okay, so I'm continuing uh, if there are no other questions. Uh, so 
yes, so this is the modification that we do. So this gives you, since we restricted the set of cells, this will give you a subspace uh, of the plus prime space. And then there's a further construction uh, on, the, on the space. So we DDM here can be, uh, so we need to make another uh, operation on the space. So there's a, there's, so we need to take a quotient relation. So the, so the, so the quotient relation is as follows. Uh, two N cells are going to be identified if each individual element of the uh, tuple uh, differs by a multiple of a scalar element from the D to the top unity, the powers of the D to the top unity. So this mu D is the powers of uh, the subgroup generated by the scalar group of uh, D to the top unity uh, and its powers. So, uh, so you make this identification and you will get something, you will get a quotient space. This quotient space is going to be our target space, E by DM. And you can think of this quotient uh, operation as a map of spaces. So you're identifying certain cells whenever the matrices differ by a scalar. And then more precisely, in fact, this is a vibration sequence, meaning that the homotopy groups are very related. So you can compute the homotopy groups. If you know one, you can compute the other essentially. And the fiber, the difference between the two from the homotopical point of view is the classifying space of mu D, which is the classifying space of this scalar group here. Okay, so, uh, so this is a variation of the classifying space that we uh, discussed with my student, uh, Dan Scheinbaum, before. And uh, these kind of constructions, uh, in that case, we looked at the polygroup. So we can replace the unitary group with other groups and then try to do similar constructions. But in this talk, we will be only focusing on the unitary group. So what is the construction? So I will be just sketching the construction. Uh, given an operator so solution for a linear constraint system, uh, what we want to do is to construct a space. So this space, uh, uh, sorry, map, uh, we already constructed the space. So the map here is constructed as follows. So our topological areas is a two-dimensional two cell complex, so I have to tell you where the cells go. So the zero cells uh, of the uh, topological uh, realization X are going to go to the unique uh, zero cell in the, in the B by DM. So there's a single uh, cell in this complex, zero cell in this complex. And the one cells uh, of, the, uh, of X, they are going to go to the one cells uh, that are labeled by the equivalence class of the operator solution evaluated at V, vertex V. So there are matrices here, TV, that we have. And uh, B by DM, remember, it's the, uh, you have to identify the scalars in B by DM. So that, therefore, you're sending the, uh, the one edge, one, one cell, which is labeled by B, to the operator equivalence class of the operator after multiplication with the scalar uh, elements in mu D. And the two cells labeled by the edges of the hypergraph, they go to, uh, you can, uh, the boundary of it, we already defined a map on the boundary because of number two here. And you can extend this map up to homotopy in a certain way, uh, which is, uh, so you have to uh, be a little careful there and then there's a construction uh, one has to uh, apply, uh, which I'm not telling you uh, uh, in, this, in this presentation, but you can think of it as, simply triangulating the disks, the two disks, in a special way. And when you triangulate them, what you should be careful of is that the boundary operators on the boundary are determined by the operator solution, and they're all commuting. But when you put the operators in the side, the, uh, inside the disk, the edges, the triangulation, you should be careful that everything commutes. That is the thing that you should make sure. Uh, and the choice doesn't make a difference up to homotopy. So for example, if you have the Mermin square, the, the two cells, they're already triangulated. So there's not much you can do. So in the, there's not much you have to do in number three. So in number one, uh, so you send all the zero cells to the unique zero cell, meaning that you collapse all the vertices to a single vertex. So there are one, two, three, uh, three vertices. These four vertices are identified to a single thing. So there are one, two, three vertices. And uh, the number two is already depicted on the picture. All you have to do is just uh, uh, take the, uh, say the, uh, you can just, uh, you should say that the two operators are uh, uh, the same up to, up to sign. Uh, 
that's the thing. And the number three, this is already uh, defined uh, because it's already triangulated, so you, have, you don't have to further triangulate. But if you, let, let's say we had a Merman star here where you had uh, square-like objects for the, uh, for, the, for the disks, then you should need to, you, you would need to further triangulate it. And then three would be uh, used in that case. So this is the construction of the map. So what we achieved is that there's a triple of things that we want to uh, topologically interpret, uh, the linear constraint system, the operator relations, uh, solutions. And then uh, we turn it into a, uh, this data. Okay, but we can actually get rid of tau here because essentially in the linear constraint system, the tau, the right-hand side of the column, the phase factors, they can be uh, obtained from the operator solution. If you know the operator solution, you can just work them out. Therefore, you can actually forget about the cohomology class tau. So what you are having, in fact, the triple uh, is only uh, encoded in terms of a homotopy class of a map from X, the topological realization to the P by dm. This is the uh, quotient of the classifying space that we construct. Classifying space for contractual in this case. Uh, therefore, the emphasis has shifted from hypergraphs and uh, hypergraphs of two-dimensional side complexes and operator solutions to maps on this two-dimensional side complex. And this way of thinking about uh, operator solutions actually gives you an equivalence relations on operator, operator relations in a certain way. For example, if I have two operator relations on H, uh, then I can say, well, they're equivalent if they're homotopically, uh, they, if they give, give homotopic maps on the right-hand side. So it gives you a way of uh, identifying operator solutions. It actually gives you more flexibility. You can even replace, you can even change the hypergraph here. Uh, so to be able to, uh, so I will, I will tell about that in the, uh, next slide. So before that, let me uh, just tell more about the homotopy classes. So uh, therefore, since we want to understand the homotopy classes, so you can think of these as labels for distinct operator solutions. So we want to understand the homotopy class of maps from X to B by DM. So this is the set of homotopy classes. So that means essentially we look at continuous maps uh, up to continuous deformation. So this way, is, uh, this provides a way to classify operator solutions. Uh, and then it's kind of good. Uh, the topologists have developed uh, lots of tools to understand these homotopy class of maps for certain cases. For example, you want to, you can understand homotopy class of maps in the case of SVT classification. Uh, so here it turns out again uh, computable because we restricted our interest to two-dimensional cell complexes on the target, the domain here. And uh, there's a classical theory of uh, homotopy class of maps for these kind of spaces. Although the target is quite large. Uh, due to Whitehead, uh, that says that we can essentially compute this algebraically. All we need to know is the first and the second homotopy groups of the target space here. So this boils down the labeling into a homotopy computation, so we need to know pi 1 and pi 2 of this space. Currently, I don't know the pi 1 and pi 2 of this space, so it's a completely homotopy theoretic problem. Uh, in general, uh, I don't know the answer. But in this talk, we will do something uh, to avoid this problem and then actually replace this space E bar with something else, uh, which will give us uh, an easy, which will put, put us in an easy, easier situation, in which case we can actually compute the pi 1 and pi 2. And we will be able to label uh, the um, operator solutions. That will be a stable approach. Before that, I want to tell you how the equivalence is taught uh, in this case. So we have the hypergraph for the Merman square arrangement, uh, Merman square linear constraint system, and the Merman uh, square here, and the star, oh, sorry, square over here, and the star over here. So you can refine uh, the topological realization into the middle one, so that you can see, uh, you can treat the middle one as a homotopy between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So more precisely, if you think, if you say T1, the uh, Merman square uh, operator solution tensor with identity two by two matrix. And uh, we just take the uh, Merman star uh, solution, which is uh, uh, eight by eight unitary matrices. Then if I think of this T1 and T2, they will be homotopic maps as maps from the torus. So this is the topologist notation for torus, S1 cross S1, the non-contractable loops. So the, uh, to the target space that we constructed. So those, these two things actually labeled by the same thing uh, in, this, in this formalism. So this is uh, an illustration of the classification. So in the classification, we are also uh, free about on the, on the hypergraphs. All we are fixing is the homotopy type of the uh, topological realization. 
So let's go to the stabilization process. So the stabilization process is used in algebraic topology. So what we are doing, what we want to achieve is the following. So the unitary group uh, n by n by matrices, we can embed them inside uh, unitary matrices uh, n plus one uh, cross n plus one by adding an uh, one on the diagonal here and keeping the octagonal zero. All of these uh, maps are defined in a similar way. And you can take the union of these groups uh, and then the union is denoted by u. This is the stable unitary group. What does this achieve? Uh, what does this give us? Uh, if you want to compute the homotopy groups of the unitary group or its classifying space, then it's kind of hard uh, and you can't actually do it for all dimensions. But if you just stabilize it, then both period periodicity tells us that the homotopy groups of stable unitary group is uh, periodic and it's quite simple or are even is zero and are all its the integers. And if you just take the classifying space of each uh, unitary group here, uh, as you see at the bottom, these maps are going to induce stabilization maps on the classifying spaces. So the target, uh, the union of these spaces is the classifying space of the stable unitary group. And then this space uh, also, uh, the homotopy groups are determined from the homotopy groups here. They just, you just replace the roles of even and odd, that's all. And you can use this space to define a generalized homology theory known as complex K theory. How do you define complex K theory? You take the space and put it here, and you look at the homotopy class of maps from X, at any space that you want to consider, to this space. So you look at, you study the homotopy class of maps. And the uh, K theory uh, is used in the stable classification of vector bundles. Again, this is a homotopical way of uh, understanding a geometric problem. So remember that we were modifying the classifying space of the unitary group. So we can take the subspaces at each step and go to our uh, BDM space. So this is the space before taking the quotient. And you can stabilize these spaces in a similar way. And let's call the uh, stable space as BDS. So if you look at this space, uh, you can show that uh, this is an infinite loop space. Uh, in, other in other words, its homotopy groups are quite easy to understand, like the classifying space of the stable unitary group. And this gives rise to a uh, generalized cohomology theory. Uh, it is a variation of a class of cohomology theories that has been introduced uh, by Adam et al. Uh, in the paper cited below. And uh, there is a commutative version of this K theory where you just omit the deep torsion condition. Uh, that we were putting on the matrices. And this is called commutative K-theory, which is studied by uh, Simon Grishire in his thesis. So this is a detorsion version of that, where you introduce this detorsion condition on the matrices. And again, it turns out that it gives you a generalized cohomology theory if you look at the homotopy class of maps. So again, this generalized cohomology tells you uh, things about a stable classification of vector bundles with special structure uh, called commutative detorsion structure on, the, these, on their transition functions. So uh, we are one step closer to the B bar dm that we want to stabilize, but it's not, we are not there yet. So let's go to B bar dm. So we, we face a problem at this stage. So we stabilize BDM in this almost the same way we stabilize the classifying space of the unitary group, but uh, the same stabilization process does not work for the B, B by DMs. And the, fundamental, uh, the essential reason because of, uh, why this doesn't work is the following uh, inequality. So if you take the identity matrix n plus one times n plus one and multiply with a scalar, it is not the same as uh, putting a diagonal in one. Uh, on the one on the diagonal here. So it's kind of like if you just unravel the definitions and look why this doesn't descend to a map of uh, map between the B by DMs, this stabilization doesn't go down there. Uh, this is the reason. Therefore, one has to come up with a different way of stabil stabilization B by DM. So for that, uh, we need to work in the stable category of uh, spectra or uh, I don't have to use the word spectra, I was not planning to, but since Theo already mentioned about them, I can use it. Uh, or you can just think of them as generalized homology theories, homotopy the uh, category of generalized homology theories, if you don't want to use the word spectra. 
so here, uh, instead of taking the quotient first and then stabilizing stabilize the space, you can change the order. First, uh, take uh, the first stabilize the space as we did BDM to st st stabilize it into K mu D, and then take the quotient afterwards. So that's what we will do. So there's a way to take a quotient in the stable homotopy category of spectra. Once you take that quotient, you will obtain a spectrum uh, CDM. So it depends on the two parameters CDM. I'm not telling how it is defined in this slide, but if you go to the uh, archive, uh, I put a paper that I uh, mentioned at the beginning of the, I probably for, forget to mention it in the beginning of the talk. Uh, so, but the title of the uh, paper is slightly different. So it's quantitative detorsion K theory and its applications. So you can find about more about uh, more how this is constructed. So once this is constructed, again, from the general theory of, uh, uh, theory of, uh, well, by stable homotopical methods, there is a space corresponding to the generalized cohomology theory, where, which I denoted by B bar DMS. This space is going to be the stable version of uh, B bar DM. And this is the space which represents the cohomology theory, uh, CDM. So, so I cannot go into the details of the definition in this talk because of time, uh, but uh, once you construct this, the space here is automatically defined uh, up to homotopy. And this space, the stable version, comes with a map from B by DM. Therefore, once you have a linear constraint system and an operator solution, we have defined FT, and you can further compose FT by iota bar with this map to get another map from X to the stable space. And I will denote it by F hat T. So this is a coarser uh, classification. So we will lose information when you pass there, but we will gain something. So therefore, on the right-hand side, the homotopy classes of here are exactly the elements of the CDM cohomology. So these are like the stable classes of operator solutions you can think about like this, uh, like stable vector spaces, uh, uh, like an analogy. So this uh, CDM cohomology, then one wants to understand what is this cohomology theory and can we compute, compute it? And it turns out it's quite simple to compute. So the, uh, the cohomology, CDM cohomology of a space is given by two components. So this decomposition is canonical decomposition. So there's the H1 part and H2 part. And the coefficient groups are abelian groups here, is pi1 and pi2. And these are actually the homotopy groups of the B bar uh, stable. So remember the homotopy groups of B bar DM appeared before, but we don't know how to compute them. Now, the homotopy groups pi1 and pi2, they're so simple. What are they? So if you think of integer z mod d, there's a multiplication by m now. So it takes z mod d and maps it to z mod d, you just map one to the m. So this is a map of abelian groups, so there's a kernel and co-kernel. So pi2 of this space is exactly the kernel and pi1 of the space is exactly the co-kernel, the quotient, quotient group. But both, both of these groups, pi1 and pi2, they're actually isomorphic as abstract groups. They're isomorphic to Z mod greatest common divisor of DNM. So we know the pi1 and pi2. So we know the labels. So these are all the labels for distinct operator solutions. And uh, so the notation here I want to introduce is that for a CDM cohomology class, there are two parts. So I will denote them by, uh, by pi1 and pi2 corresponding to these two cohomology groups. So uh, this is the uh, cohomology theory that we are looking at. Uh, so let's see, uh, let's see how this is actually used. So the immediate application of this theorem is the following. If C, uh, if DNM are co-prime, then the linear constraint system admits a scalar solution. So let me just uh, tell you why this is true. So, so far we have associated the operator solution of the linear constraint system FT, uh, at the map FT, and then we stabilize the map FT to get F hat T. And we have seen in the last theorem that actually F hat T is going to correspond to phi 1 and phi 2. So what is phi 1 and phi 2? These are elements in the cohomology of X with coefficients in Z mod greatest common divisor of DNM, right? This is the theorem, what the theorem says. So if DNM are co-prime, this coefficient is zero. Therefore, HI is zero in both cases. Therefore, phi one and phi two has to be zero. And the further property of the construction that I haven't gone into the detail of why it is true is the following. 
So this map from pi 2 to z mod 2 d here, the map of abelian groups is going to induce a map between the homology groups. So it's a change of coefficients from z mod gdm uh, gcd to z mod d. Since the left hand side, and then the further property is that the phi 2 that appears here is going to map to the homology, uh, the tau, uh, the homology class of tau that we started with from the linear consensus. So it still sees the, uh, the tau here. So it's, it's good. Therefore, when the NMR co prime, the left hand side, the whole homology group is going to be zero. Therefore, phi 2 is going to be zero. That means tau is going to be zero. And that's why we have a scalar solution. That's how you see this. So it's exactly, uh, it's almost immediate uh, uh, consequence of the theorem. Of course, there's a different way of proving this theorem, so it's not the only way. So you don't have to go through stable homotopy theory to define this, but that's how I uh, discovered this theorem. But there's a more direct way. You can, you can do it on the linear constraint system, uh, but I won't go into that. Uh, so let me uh, try to show what other classes we have in this cohomology theory. Of course, the first thing is to look at the Merman's constructions, right? So let's do it a little bit general. Uh, so there's the Merman square operator solution here, TSQ. Uh, let's transfer it with the identity matrix of certain dimensions so that the whole thing is going to give us an operator solution in uh, unitary matrices 2n times 2n, uh, right? So I think I'm, uh, am I over time already? Uh, I think it's 45. Okay, so maybe I should be uh, rather quick. So this operator solution Tn is supposed to give us a cohomology class inside the C22n cohomology of the torus. So let's compute it. Okay, we did compute it right here because of the theorem. And there are two parts. Uh, so it's a, uh, so you need three binary elements to specify what this element, uh, what this class is. So it turns out if you compute it, so it's a computation to see that the Merman class actually corresponds to this element, 0, 0, 1. So the first part, H1, is trivial, and here you hit the non-trivial uh, cohomology class in the H2. And it's actually, there's a further consequence of that I want to mention. You can realize this cohomology, uh, the Merman class, as a class inside uh, of not the torus, but the sphere. So you can replace, you can replace the torus with a sphere. So it's a little surprising to have this because it seems like it's contradicting to the first, uh, the two theorems that I mentioned, the second one at the first, because you have a space where everything, uh, every loop contracts, but you can still detect contextuality, but I, I won't go into that, why it's not contradicting to anything. Uh, so I wanted to mention that you can replace it with sphere because of my uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so I'll just say something quickly here and then go to the next slide. So here, okay, we went from right-hand side to the left-hand side, saying that how can we classify operator solution, but we can actually try to go from left to right as well. So that means, since we know how to compute this, we have candidate labels here for linear operator solutions. So it's kind of like going opposite to, uh, to in the question of SPT classification. So once you have the cohomology classes, you can try to realize them using lattice models. So the cohomology classes here uh, can be go from the stable to unstable first. So this is a topological, purely topological question depending on the homotopy groups of E by BN. And the second step is uh, the part where you can uh, do a little bit of uh, analysis on the space to use its cell structure to extract a linear constraint system out of it, which realizes, uh, uh, which realizes this cohomology class. I think this is an interesting problem I wanted to mention, but I'm not going to say anything about this and maybe help, it can help to the uh, problem of constructing uh, contextual scenarios over uh, odd local dimensions. So finally, I want to just draw a, attention to the analogy. So lattice models that are classified by generalized cohomology theories, in particular complex K theory or real K theory, depending on the situation like the particle fact that we are considering, so in this talk, I wanted to emphasize that the operator solutions can be also generalized by generalized cohomology theories, in particular, a generalized cohomology that I have constructed here in this talk, CDM cohomology, which is obtained from a version of complex K theory. So I want to emphasize this is a version of complex K theory. Uh, at this level, there's an, an analogy. So just to make the analogy closer, uh, let's consider 
we have constructed everything over the unitary group, but we can always restrict our attention to orthogonal groups, right? That's also possible. Well, you can, you can do that and all the constructions go through. In that case, uh, the K mu D is going to be replaced by KO symmetric. So this is a real K theory uh, constructed from, uh, a version of real K theory constructed from uh, uh, symmetric matrices, symmetric orthogonal matrices. And CDM is replaced by uh, CR2N. It's another homology theory. And then this homology theory in the real case, in the second homotopy group, there are two parts. So the, uh, the SPT part here on the left-hand side, I wrote SPT here because there's a connection from this uh, generalized cohomology theory to the spin cobordism group. So pi two here of this generalized cohomology theory and the pi two of that spin cobordism group, they're isomorphic. And pi two spin cobordism group, uh, there's a lattice model realization for that uh, generalized cohomology theory, namely the uh, phase, uh, the constructed by Guan Man, who's a fermionic uh, SPT. Uh, on the other side, uh, side, the other component of pi two on the right hand side is the second cohomology group of the sphere. And we have seen that uh, here on the, uh, so it relates to, it's a real version of this computation. And the Mermin square is going to give us, is going to hit the non-trivial class here. So on the left hand side, we have Gouvan phase as a non-trivial element, and on the right hand side, we have the Merman square as the non-trivial element. So there's a kind of relation between the two in the framework stable homotopy theory. And then finally, I want to say these two things, the SVT phases and the linear constraint systems, or more uh, generally contextuality, appears uh, in the computational power of MBQC. So these two things also come together in the computational, uh, the phenomenology of computation. Power. So I wonder what is the relationship? Uh, is there a relationship between stable homotopy theory and computation in a way? Uh, and that's all I want to say. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. So I guess uh, we're open for questions. Thanks, Jihan. Um, um, uh, Robert here. Uh, I, maybe I, I could ask a question or make a comment. I mean, relating to what, uh, Gian, what you just said in the end, um, the connection to computation. So um, you worked out what Merman's square was in your topologi topological language. I mean, with the uh, first and second homotopy groups. So you, uh, and I think what holds for the Merman square, perhaps with slight modification, if it all also holds for Merman star. And uh, I mean, so we know that Merman star can be repurposed as a measurement based quantum computation. So this is the work by Anders and Brown. Um, so I think, so my suggestion is maybe um, you, you could find the function computed in your topological description. So where the, where the computed function in this MB, little tiny MBQC appears in, in your topological classification or what information about it. I, I think that maybe could be a way to get started on, on the question you posed. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, thank you for your comment, Robert. Yeah, that's uh, precisely uh, the first place to look at, yes. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't done it yet, so that, that's uh, something I'm thinking about. Uh, to take the Merman square a star example, uh, because it corresponds to also the class in the uh, cohomology theory and it's a computational interpretation. Uh, yeah, uh, that's something uh, I want to look at. That's a good question, uh, but I, I don't have anything more to say at this point. The, uh, the next person I saw with their hand up was Matt. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um when you consider this uh, subgroup of UN, where, where you took like the torsion and then did some equivalence class, is that some just some finite group or is still is that still some uh, continuous group? Okay, uh, okay. I think you're referring to this part of the construction. Uh -huh. So, so here, uh, unitary group is a topological group, uh, and we are looking at the n tuples of group elements here, and then in the next part we are restricting to n tuples of group elements again with these two properties, 
but uh, these uh, so you cannot write BDM as a classifying space of a group in general. Mm -hmm. Let's say let's take an example uh, like an extreme case. So instead of a group uh, U M here, you can put here a arbitrary group G. Mm -hmm. And in particular, if you plug in here uh, abelian group, for example, and uh, then the classifying space BDM over here, or whatever uh, the subspace satisfying these two conditions is going to be realized as a classifying space of a subgroup. But the thing is, the interesting part is that if you have a not non abelian group, then this construction does not come from a classifying space of a group. So this thing, the restrictions here, they don't actually define a subgroup of the UN. That's my point. Okay. And uh, Ajit? Okay, do I need to? Okay, I already unmuted. Uh, sorry, I already enabled the speaking. Uh, if you want to ask your question. Okay, we cannot hear. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, well, there might be uh, technical problems or uh, something else. Is there a chat after this? Uh, yes, so I'm going to initiate the discussion session. Uh, maybe. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, maybe we can close the workshop. Uh, and, okay, let me just stop sharing my screen and yes. stop, okay. stop uh, the Good. recording, just a second.